Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's really great to see a UK gathering of clinicians, patients uh, to get the ball rolling, start to think about FMD, its interrelationships with other conditions, and to start to share, if you like, some of our thinking, some of our understanding about these uh, conditions. So um, my name's Dave Adlam, and, and I come from the dreaming spires of, um, of Leicester, uh, which perhaps better known for this guy. Anybody remember him? So I, I usually put this slide up um, to uh, when I have a kind of patient meeting to try and say to people that in Leicester we are not in the least bit ageist in our management of patients. So, you know, even this guy here found collapsed in a council car park. We gave him a really good go <laughs> as him going through his CT scanner. But I think he might have been a, uh, a little tiny bit far gone, even for us. So we're talking about this uh, condition uh, today, fibromuscular dysplasia. You've already seen uh, lots, uh, it's perhaps enough uh, strings of beads to set yourself up a jewelry shop. So. I thought I'd put an, another one up here. And the difference, I guess, here is that this is a patient who didn't present with a problem related to the uh, renal artery string of beads or the carotid artery narrowing that they had, but they actually presented with a, uh, with a heart problem, with a heart attack. And I think it's important to say this and sort of sitting and watching the, uh, the talks that we've had so far, it's, it's sort of easy because to some extent what we do as specialists is we talk about the patients that we see who've had a problem relating to the particular vascular bed that we look after. Uh, and obviously I look after uh, our heart patients and now increasingly patients with other FMD uh, problems related to FMD. Um, but, but, but actually it's sort of almost easy to build a picture as you listen to specialist after specialist saying, well, you know, FMD in my organ causes this consequence and FMD in my organ causes this prob uh, problem, to sort of build a picture of sort of impending disaster in multiple places, okay? But actually, um, you know, whilst there are patients clearly with FMD in particular places who develop problems, that's why a number of you are here, um, we have to also put that in perspective in terms of the number of events that actually happen in patients. So, and SCAD is perhaps quite a good example of that in that uh, there are perhaps quite a significant proportion of patients who come and see me because they've had a coronary problem. We then screen them and find that they have problems elsewhere. But actually of those patients who then go on to develop a significant problem related to the FMD that we find elsewhere in their body, they are definitely in the minority group. So there are certainly some patients that we would want to keep an eye on things. And I, you know, I think I would, uh, would and did support in the consensus statement, both for SCAD and FMD, that for most patients who uh, want to know about these things that we do the screening thing, we also have to kind of put that in proportion. So we have to put it in a box in the room that this is a, a problem that we have, this is a blood vessel problem that we have, but it doesn't, just because you have a problem in a particular vascular bed, doesn't mean that's actually gonna cause an issue for you. I think that's really, really important to get that sort of perspective right. One of the other things hopefully we can learn uh, with FMD as we try to build a momentum behind uh, sort of spreading knowledge and understanding about FMD and also uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, support the incredible research program that Alexandra Pursu has uh, established in Europe uh, is some of the lessons that we've learned from setting up SCAD, the SCAD research program. And there's a, a few familiar faces in the room who will be familiar with some of the things that we, you know, we've done less successfully and some of the things that we've done more successfully, but we've certainly tried hard and I think we've made great progress. So for me anyway, this is where it began. Um, this is Bex getting her reward for basically founding the SCAD uh, research program uh, in the UK and uh, as I've said, there are many in the room who supported her in, in doing that. And Bex came to see me in clinic. She was a patient of mine, had a problem with her heart and came and said, look, we need to understand this disease a bit more. We need to get on with it and do some research. So I said to her, well, SCAD's really rare. You know, 
we probably won't find another patient with it. And she said, well, actually, I've got a bunch of Facebook friends uh, already who've got this condition, and you know, maybe we could tap into them, and it might build into a bigger group over time. And that's how it's worked, and the momentum has worked. And I think, you know, again, it's important to understand with research that the timelines are quite long. It's quite hard sometimes to get, you know, we all want answers immediately, and yet they have to, we have to build those answers. We have to sort of get the data together, accumulate data from lots of people. And uh, from an FMD perspective, Alexandra's done, he, he is, uh, you know, one of the sort of most softly spoken, but one of the most dynamic uh, clinical researchers in Europe in terms of consensus building, and that's so critical for uh, doing uh, research into these conditions. And so, you know, these are some of the things that, uh, that the group have done um, in terms of setting up websites, uh, handing out leaflets uh, to tell clinicians about this uh, disease, in this case, SCAD, because actually you'd be s potentially be surprised, many of those uh, patients who have SCAD will not be surprised, that there are actually clinicians out there who, yeah, now they might have heard of it, but they don't really know very much more about it than that. And I think, I like to think anyway, that we've moved that on now to a situation where there are much more people that discuss it. And we're really hoping that that is also the case uh, with FMD. So I'm here to talk, or at least mention a little bit about SCAD, what happens with SCAD. So SCAD is a condition where you develop a bruise in the wall of the coronary artery. And this causes a compression from the outside and you can see how it squashes the black lines. You're getting used to these pictures now. You're all going to be vascular radiologists for the end of the day. And you can see here just how it narrows down the artery, and that's what causes the problem. This is a laser light picture of the inside of a coronary artery. And actually, the coronary artery, the bit that's supposed to be the coronary artery, is the circle in the middle. And the thing that looks like a sort of black half moon around the outside is where this bruise is squashing from the outside uh, and causing the problem. And this is a, a, an artery in red here, and the black is the bruise sort of wrapping around the outside of the vessel and compressing it from the outside. And this is an important diagnosis because its management is very different from uh, patients who present, if, like, if you like, with more conventional coronary artery problems, in that actually if you can leave it alone without having to go down the line of stents and bypass surgery, generally speaking, it will heal of itself. Now, you can't always do that. Sometimes patients have to be treated with stents. Sometimes patients have to have a bypass operation because that's what they need to get them out of uh, trouble in the immediate situation. But it also will heal if it's left alone. We're starting from the research to understand a bit more about the condition. And uh, th those of you who've sort of followed a little bit about this, it's the inside out versus the outside in hypothesis, which I, I'm not quite sure what that sounds like, but I'll explain it very quickly, which is to start with, we thought that dissections were all about developing something called a flap, a connection between where the blood should be flowing and the wall of the artery. And what we're finding is actually probably the problem arises in the wall of the artery with a bruise or a bleed that forms there, and that then accumulates and causes the problem in these patients. I won't test you on angiographic findings, um, but I, I did want to point out that there are a number of patients, and again, you find this with the multiple vascular beds in FMD, there are a number of patients who, when they present with their scan, have um, problems in more than one vessel. And one of the issues with SCAD is that it does have a recurrence rate, okay? And rather like the sort of things I was talking about with FMD uh, uh, a little bit earlier, that's something we have to think about as patients who have this condition and put it in proportion. And one of the things that we've learned about uh, this disease is yet that recurrences do occur. Perhaps one in 10 of these patients have a recurrence within a three year period. So it's not a trivial recurrence rate. But actually, even with recurrences, what we're learning is that actually people still do very well. They can still come out the other side of these events. They can do very well. They can live their lives. They can do all of the things that they want to do afterwards. We have to look after them and see them in the clinic and do the screening tests and things like that. But these things are not necessarily you know, a total disaster. They're part of, if you like, what it's like to um, live with this condition. So one of the things we've learned about SCAD and the reason that I'm here wittering on about it at an FMD day 
is because what one of the things that we've uh, learned from the research internationally is that this condition is associated with many of the things that we've been talking about today, which is the finding of abnormalities in blood vessels elsewhere in the body. Sometimes they could be swellings, sometimes they can be little dissections, little tears, and sometimes they can be classical FMD, as I showed you a picture of before. And there are lots of different examples of these that we find in SCAD patients. But as I said, perhaps importantly here, um, uh, in, in the overwhelming majority of SCAD patients, the FMD that we find doesn't seem to cause a great deal of problems. So finding patients, uh, I'm not aware of, I think I'm now aware of one patient who's ha had an intervention on a renal FMD in a SCAD survivor. But this is out of hundreds of patients who have SCAD. And actually, likewise, if you look in the FMD registries at patients who've had a heart attack due to SCAD, so that's FMD patients who've been diagnosed because they had a problem elsewhere, SCAD is really quite rare in FMD patients. So again, it's sort of this message that I wanted to give out that, yes, there are abnormalities of the blood vessels, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every abnormality leads to a problem. Uh, and I think that's very important. Alexandra showed this graph, he drew it, um, I copied it, um, but basically to show that we don't understand everything at the moment about this condition. We don't even really understand how many patients with SCAD have FMD. And part of the reason for that is that a lot of the studies at the moment have involved radiologists who are really into SCAD, looking at the pictures and going, I think that's FMD. And the trouble with that is, is that we all get a bit enthusiastic and go, well, oh, I think that might be FMD too, and that, and that, and that. And actually little mild things, we've talked a bit about tortuosity, sometimes they can all get lumped in together and we can call something an abnormality which actually may be just be part of a variation. And one of the things that we're working on together with Alexandre is, uh, you know, I mentioned his collaborative zeal and he's been enormously helpful in uh, a lot of our uh, UK SCAD research is you know, he's currently beavering away, analyzing all of the images from our SCAD cohort, uh, blinded, and not literally, but you know, so he doesn't know who's got SCAD and who's a healthy volunteer. We've, we have some amazing healthy volunteers who've helped us with the research as well. And hopefully we can answer some of these questions about how often do we really see FMD? How often do we really see important arterial abnormalities that need to be followed up? And, uh, you know, and also how important are the findings that we make? So we're building a picture of a series of overlapping disorders. And we keep dropping these sort of three, four letter acronyms out there. SCAD, FMD, CCAD, that's the carotid dissection stuff, connective tissue disorders, and so on and so forth. And we are, this is important because it's starting to help us to understand how these processes form. I don't think that they're all one disease, but it may be that there's a little bit, an element of SCAD which has some of the same profile, some of the same risks as FMD, and that, of course, by, if you like, unifying the, the approach to the research and working together on it can help us to find some solutions and insights into both diseases. Genes. Very important to say that these conditions are not strongly inherited. So if you have a condition like SCAD or indeed an FMD, your children are not going to have it. You know, it's extremely unlikely outside the context of the hereditary connective tissue disorders and very rare families where you've got a sibling or a mother daughter but they are the they are the if you like the unusual ones the usual ones are patients in which there isn't a family history okay but that doesn't mean that genes are not involved because genes can be part of the profile of the risk of a condition and that's part of what we've been doing. So we've been looking at lots of different genes and um, uh, some of this we hope will be coming out in the next sort of year from a SCAD perspective. Um, and uh, Alexandra has already mentioned, if you like, the first breakthrough. Now this isn't the answer to everything, but this is a, uh, a, a gene, it's what we call a, a common variant, which means that lots of people in the world will have this. And that's why it's not something that runs in families. Lots of people will have it. But if you have a particular version of it, it increases your risk of having SCAD. Okay? So it's like a risk factor. It's a bit like if you smoke, you're at an increased risk 
of developing conventional heart disease. It's like that kind of thing, but not everybody who smokes has heart disease. And not everybody who doesn't smoke doesn't have heart disease, if that makes sense. So it's about, it, it confers a risk, but it's not an all or nothing thing. But the interesting thing is the as uh, association. So first of all, again, just to, just to emphasize and having uh, Professor Pursue with us today is, is, is a sort of really exemplar of the fact that this is a world of collaboration. We in the UK can't answer the questions the key questions about the, the condition SCAD uh, without our friends in France, in the Mayo Clinic in the US, uh, uh, in Australia, for example, were the, were the groups that all joined together to do this genetic research. And Professor Pursue has done an amazing job of bringing together European uh, physicians with an interest in FMD to really advance our understanding of this condition. And we are strongly motivated to try and support that uh, move in the FMD community. So one of the interesting things about SCAD uh, is, uh, or SCAD and FMD, is that they are both associated with this particular gene, as is migraine, as is carotid dissection. And actually, perhaps also interestingly, it has a slight protective effect against conventional coronary artery disease. So it's not all negative, this gene. Okay? <laughs> But it certainly has something to do with blood vessels. Uh, and of course, what that does is it provides us with a, a strong motivation of a route, a path to go down with the research to try to understand what we all want, which is to understand the mechanisms behind these conditions a bit better so that we can hopefully move towards a time in which we can say, look, we need to target this because hopefully that will help our patients. Um, so lots more to do here. One gene does not um, a disease understand, but it's a starting point. Uh, again, uh, we have also a, a position in consensus paper. I only put this up really just to sort of emphasize that there he is, Alexandre Pursue is down there. And again, I think it's really key, and, and you know, Professor Pursue was kind enough to invite me to support the FMD uh, statement as well. And I think it's a really key thing that you know, we work together to try and understand these diseases. Um, so I put this up. Some of you have heard this before, I know, but it makes me cry. So I'm going to uh, read it to you again. So this is the sort of reason why, why people like um, Professor Pursue, Tina, and myself uh, are interested in trying to understand these conditions. And this was written by uh, the patient, the, sorry, the son of one of, the, one of my patients. I think he's about seven. Don't know. Handwriting maybe looks about eight, but he's quite young. So he's written, when I grow up, I want to be. And uh, this is what it says, so you don't have to squint. It says, when I grow up, I want to be a cardiologist. Spelt wrong. <laughs> because my mum has a heart condition and I want to help her heart. I will have to go to university and work hard. If I don't get that job, then I will be a YouTuber. <laughs> and make new games for Xbox, PlayStation and Wii. I can make movies if I can't think of any other games. But I would love if I could be a cardiologist. Interestingly, spelt right this time. <laughs> and the teacher has written, what a wonderful aspiration. If you work hard at school, hopefully you'll get to be a cardiologist. So maybe this young man will come in at the end when we start to understand a bit more and finish the research off for us. That would be great, wouldn't it? Um, so this is it, really. SCAD research, FMD research, it's a collaborative partnership. We can't do the research without uh, people like Professor Pursue unifying everybody, bringing everybody together. We can't do it without you, the patients. You know, there are many, many uh, faces in this room who've uh, made the trek to Leicester, who've squeezed through scanners. Some of you have been to Pisa to get your scans done by uh, uh, Rosa Maria Bruno. I know that, you know, uh, and you, you are an amazing patient group who have uh, supported the research over the years. And certainly from a, a, a SCAD perspective and also from an FMD perspective, from the European perspective, you know, we are starting to see the trickle down rewards from that in terms of improving our understanding. There is a long way to go, we know that, but you know, if we keep going, keep walking together. So I should tell you what these things are. Um, so these are, um, the Laetoli footprints. So these were laid down by uh, two Australopithecuses. 
or is it Australopithecus? Somebody can correct me anyway. Ancient human species, millions of years ago, they were walking across um, some ash that had pumped out of a volcano somewhere in Kenya. And the reason I like this, not just because they are rather ancient and incredibly amazing fossils, but also because, in my mind at least, they're walking side by side and hand in hand. And that is what research into SCAD and FMD is all about. So I do the wittering, and lots of other people do all of the work. Um, so just uh, bear in mind the thanks to all of the many, many, many people um, who contribute to all of the pictures and images and ultimately the data and the publications that uh, we have talked about today. Thank you. Thank you.